Well, greeting friends. What a joy to be able to come and connect with you again today. You know, the Lord has been talking to us, and I believe the Lord has been talking to His church uh, in these last days, and He's been preparing us. And these are very exciting times that we're in. You know, truly, I think that the prophets of long time ago would have loved to have lived in these days. What a privilege we have to be part of what God is doing in our age. This is not a time for fear. It's not a time to want to run away and hide. Jesus said, as you see that day approaching, that we must lift our heads high because our redemption is drawing near. And so we, we are part of the redeemed. And so we are part of those that are called to lift our heads high. Now, I, I want to speak to you today about some of the end time happenings that are going on around us. I'm not going to get too specific this morning into all the eschatological happenings and, and there are many but this morning in particular I just want to speak a word of caution to the church there's so much good stuff happening out there but there's also so much flaky stuff happening out there you know this is a time where on the internet we're starting to see more and more teaching about eschatology and the book of revelations and you know I hear so many people standing up and saying this is what it is saying and then I look at it I go <laughs> that's not what it's saying uh, sounds good uh, but not true and we need to be part of those who are rooted in the word of God we need to be part of those kinds of people that can stand up and correctly divide the words that are spoken and uh, to be a, a light to the nations and so if many people are being deceived by many teachings going around let us not be one of them so this morning in particular, I want us to start off on a bit of a series. We're going to go on a bit of a journey. And in that journey, I want us to discuss the topic of dreams and visions and, and how they affect and how they impact the church and the people of Christ. Uh, what is it? What should we make of it? Well, just to start off, I just want our, our opening reading to come from the book of Acts. And there in the book of Acts chapter 2, we read where... The prophecy which was given to Joel is then spoken over in the book of Acts. And, and please go, go and check it out for yourself. Don't let me just do your Bible reading for you. Go and look it out and go and look at the deeper context and the words around this verse that I'm speaking. Do a bit of research. Find out the context, the original words as spoken by Joel. It's a, an amazing uh, study. But just one verse that I want to take out of Acts chapter 2 is these words. It says, the prophecy of the last days, and I believe we, we can all agree that we're living in the last days. In the last days, it shall be. Now just pay careful attention. God says, in the last days, it shall be. God is saying, I don't care what the debate is saying. I, I don't care what the great scholars are saying and how some people may deny it. But God is saying, it shall be in the last days that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and God goes further he says even on my male servants and on my female servants in those days I shall pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy Go read that up for yourself. Acts chapter 2 verses 17 and 18. Let me just say that there are times in life, I'm sure you've experienced it for yourself, where things can get pretty daunting, where things can get pretty overwhelming. A and there are times in life where we need something to cling to. And if you've heard my teaching before, uh, you will know how highly I value the scriptures. I, I believe it's the infallible word of God. I, I, I believe there is no error in it. I believe that it is for today. I believe in the word of God. But I also know that we are frail and we are flesh. And, and there are times that we go through, through thing, things in life and through happenings, through traumas, where we just don't have the wherewithal to go and pick up a passage of scripture. Have you ever been there where it just feels like it's black words on on white paper some of you some of your versions there'll be times red words on white paper and and there are times in life where things can be so overwhelming that if it was not for God speaking to us 
directly in, in a personal way that, that we would be totally overwhelmed. You know, God is so beautiful. He does this in many ways. There have been times in my life where somebody's just sent me a little SMS or a little WhatsApp saying, Hey Warren, praying for you. Or, Hey Warren, got this verse for you. And they sent me a verse. And, and, and it's amazing that that verse just lined up perfectly. It was just what I needed at that time I say thank you God to speaking to me through your people there have been times that God has spoken to me through a program that I've watched or through a headline that I've read and but but here the Bible is saying that God will speak to his people through dreams and through visions and there have been times that I've gone through overwhelming times in my life where God by his mercy has given me a dream or a vision and, and that has been exactly what I've needed. And I said, yes, Lord, now I can identify what is going on in my life. Now I can put my finger on it and, and I feel empowered because now I can do something about it. So thank you, God, for steering me in that way. There have also been other times where I've been totally settled. Not, I, I've not felt like I'm going through any difficulty or going through any trial. There have been times that I've had the complete peace of the Lord. And, and then I've had a dream which has come and shaken me a bit. It's almost as if I was too comfortable in a certain situation. And God was saying, Warren, I, I need you to focus. Warren, there's, there's an area where, where y you're getting a little bit lazy right now. Warren, I don't need my servants to be sleeping. I need my servants to be watchful. And God has sent me a dream to wake me up as it is. And, and thank God that he does speak to us in times such as this. I, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that God is a God that speaks to us and still meets us in such a personal way. I'm so glad that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are, are so for today, that, that for the entire church age until Jesus comes again. And I thank the Lord Jesus that we're in an age where we're being encouraged to stir up the things that God has given to us, things like prophecy and dreams and visions. But I also believe that God is not going to give you a vision for your family. He's not going to give you a vision for your workplace. He's not going to give you a vision for your church. He's not going to give you a vision for your country. He's not going to give you a vision for, for, for the world uh, until you start being a steward of the visions that God gives to you personally. And God's going to do that. You know, there's that whole principle in Scripture, if you're faithful with the little God is going to start increasing that and give you much. The only thing is, is that we cannot be faithful with the little un unless we recognize what it is that God is doing through us and what, is, what it is that God is giving us to be faithful with. Sometimes God gives us dreams and visions, but we've got such a stereotypical view of what it should be like that we're not recognizing, hey, this is from God. And if it's from God, I need to be a steward of what God has given to me. So, so, yeah, we need to learn how to be stewards. But how do you be a steward unless you've learned to recognize first? And so I believe that when you start developing your gift of dreams and prophecies, I, I, I believe that you need to start looking on a really close, personal level. D don't, don't get a dream or prophecy and then want to run around and want to go and you know correct your church, correct your elders, correct all the deacons, go and speak a word to the president. I, I just don't think that God operates like that. Certainly hasn't in my personal experience and in the experiences of all the people that I've known uh, over the time that have that have dealt with these things and and learnt from these things. So so here's the the one thing I want you to tap into as we start exploring this. Perhaps this is new to you. Start looking to God to speak to you in a deeply personal way, to lead and to direct, uh, to encourage. But, but don't go and jump off the deep end now. Don't go running ahead of what we're saying. We're going to unfold these lessons in the next couple of weeks. So, so don't wake up tomorrow and say, hey, God has given me a vision. I need to go quit my job or uh, I, I need to go and put my boss in his place. God has confirmed everything I've ever thought about. No, no, hold, hold your horses there. Just hold on to it. God is going to start speaking to you on a personal level. And I believe he's going to start training you with words that are specifically 
tailor to you. Some of these things must get spoken, they must get shared, others must be kept to yourself. Right. When we, when we talk about vision, the, the word vision is not new to this world. Even, even worldly people, even, even unbelievers know the word vision. I, I mean, I hear people talking about vision statements and, and, and mission statements. and It fascinates me how even people that are not in relationship with Jesus, even unbelievers seem to be tapping into the principle or one of the principles of vision and they seem to be getting the peripheral benefits. And, and when I say peripheral, it is just peripheral. I'll explain that in just a moment. But they get the peripheral benefits of one of the principles of visions and vision statements. And what is that principle that I'm referring to? Was well, that one that we found when the Lord said to his prophet Habakkuk. Remember Habakkuk? In, in, in chapter 2 and verse 2, God said to Habakkuk, now God gave him a vision and then God said to him, he said, Habakkuk, write the vision and make it plain on tablets. I, I, love, I love that about God. God doesn't just want us to be enshrouded in mystery like this vision and dream world is this ethereal world. No, God is saying, make it plain. Write it on tablets so that it can be communicated and make it plain. And then he goes on to say, so that he may run who reads it. So, if we just now put that into context, this was a word for the nation because Habakkuk was not a beginner prophet. Prophets in those days were called seers because they would see visions and they would have dreams and so they weren't novices. And So this was a vision at this stage that God said to Habakkuk, write it down and make it plain and so that he that runs with it. So, so this was something that would be taken. It was for the nation and in fact it's, it's, it's a vision that was given then that is even applicable to us today so that we can write it down even on this day, right? But, but even your personal vision, your personal dream, I want to encourage you, write it down. Write it down. Journal it. You, you may get a vision that in itself, the symbolism of it, we'll go into symbolism later, but the symbolism of it doesn't mean very much. But when you journal it, and then after a while you start paging back, you'll see a definite pattern starting to emerge. I'll speak more about that a little bit later. So Habakkuk was to write God's word down, the vision that God had given to him. Uh, it's not something that he had just dreamed up. It's not something where you've got a board of executives sitting in a room or a board of elders sitting in a room saying, right, what's our vision? Let's, let's thrash this thing out. Come on, let's write this thing down. Let's thrash it out. And then I'll tell you what we're going to do. Once we've thrashed this vision out, we're going to put it on a board and we're going to put, put it up so that everybody knows. It's going to be a great sales pitch. That, that, that's not vision in the sense of what God was speaking to Habakkuk. You see, it's not something that had to be worked up. A, a vision was something that was initiated from God, and it was given from God to his prophet, and then he said to his prophet, he said, right, Habakkuk, now be faithful in writing this down. Write this down so that somebody can run with this message. God wasn't just speaking about a, a, a catchphrase. And now, now I'm so happy that in many of the churches that I've visited, many of the churches that I've been to, I, I've seen this principle of writing things down. This is the peripheral principle that I was speaking to earlier about how even unbelievers tap in. So even unbelievers have learned how to write the vision down, make their mission statement known, put it up on banners, get your, get your graphic design team out. And, and it's so good. I, I want to tell you, I, I'm actually... Uh, very impressed by some of the banners that I've seen hanging on the foyer walls or the entrances of some of the churches. And I mean, you've seen some of the statements, things like we exist to make God known on a personal level, or we exist to be a blessing to the local church, to the outer community, uh, community and then to, a world, to the world at large. Or uh, we're a group of real people trying to make a real Jesus known in these real times, etc. Et right. And, and you get all this graphic on the on the wall and you get it written down and it's all very good and some of it is even biblical um, I, I, I've been to I've been to many church growth seminars where they speak about vision and and they come keep coming back to the the book of Habakkuk and without without fail 
it's almost as if every church growth seminar that I've been to or DVD that I've watched somewhere along the line they're going to bring up Habakkuk 2 verse 2 it's, it's got to do with the how to's of vision it's got to do with the how to's of mission and how they relate to the church but here's the question I, I heard somebody saying this once so this is not a Warren original but I heard somebody saying this once and man it's resonated with me here's the question do we see what is written or printed on the wall being reflected in the hearts and in the attitudes and in the practices of the people that worship them you see, I, you know, at the end of the day, after you've spent your budget on the printing, after you've spent your budget, uh, and you've spent weeks teaching on series, you know, a couple of months down the line, a year down the line, are, are, you, st are you seeing within the people what has been reflected from that boardroom meeting, right? Because if it's a vision that is from God, you will see it in the hearts of the people. It's not just going to be a catchphrase up on a wall somewhere. Vision, vision runs far deeper than just graffiti. This is where I'm getting to now. It's not just about saying, hey, I've got a good idea. Let's write it and put it on a wall. No, no, no. It's far deeper, far, far deeper than just graffiti. Vision is, vision is life to God's people. It's life to the church. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29 in the 18th verse, and in the King James Version, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, some, some versions have got other translate, tr uh, translations. They'll say where people, the people cast off restraint. Uh, I think the King James Version has just nailed it here. Where there is no vision, the people perish. This is a serious matter, man. Uh, newsflash, death is a serious matter and the Bible is saying that without vision death happens death happens so you may not die immediately I, I, I think back of to the God, Garden of Eden and uh, where God said to Adam he says in the day that you eat of it you shall die well Adam carried on living after that he only died at the age of 900 right no but, but he died in a different way and I believe that so many people have died in other ways, and it's, and it's w ways that are more eternally significant than just physical death. They've died, in their, they've died in their hopes. They've died in their desires. They've died in their passion for Christ. They've died in their passion for the mission of the church. They've died in their zest. They've died in their zeal. They've died in their relationships one with the other. Something about them has died because they've, they've lost that one thing that God has given to them to hold on to. You see, God will give you a vision as an anchor. There, there, there are times where, where you need that anchor so that when you start getting lost, when you start getting lost in all the things that demand your time the things that would erode your personality the things that would steal and rob from you when you get lost from those things you need something that you can return back to and that's why before any great quest God will give you a vision so that you know what you need to return to now can I get just a little bit controversial with you I want to get as controversial as the Bible gets. You've, you've got to allow a preacher to get as controversial as the Bible gets. Don't ever allow a preacher to get more controversial than a Bible because then he's just trying to be a shock jock and he's just trying to get attention and we've seen some of those around. Don't ever allow a preacher to get more but don't ever allow him to be less controversial than what the Bible is. Now, what am I trying to say? This scripture, where it says, for lack of vision, people perish, it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just say that in isolation. It goes on. There's more. And it says, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The, the, the Bible does not have in mind vision as being something that is just written on a wall, as in graffiti. The vision has in mind something that has been written on the heart. Paul, Paul writes about certain Gentiles, and that's you and me that he's writing about. He's referring to us. Uh, the true church throughout all generations 
since the first century, since the, 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 the church was born. Paul's writing about these Gentiles, that there were some people, that's us, who show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Romans 2.15 I, I, I trust, brother, that in your conduct, conduct I, I trust my sister, that in your demeanor, the way that you deal with people, I trust that you show that God's law is written on your heart. I trust with those business deals, you show that God's law is written on your heart. I trust in your work ethic at work that you show that God's law is written on your heart. I trust in your attitude towards people that are perhaps of a less uh, income bracket, poor people, perhaps people that are ill or sick. I, I, I trust that in all that you do, you show that God's law is written on your heart. What am I saying? That God's vision statement is within you. Now, they may not be able to see your heart, but they can see the expression of that vision in your conduct. Now, it's true that we're no longer under the law of sin and death. So that's not what Paul is referring to here. Remember, Paul is writing to, to the New Testament church. He's not referring to the Mosaic law. I, 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 I believe that, that we can rejoice because the Bible makes it very clear that, that, that we may not be under the Mosaic law, but we're very much under the law of the Spirit of life. Go and read it up in Romans 8 verse 2. It even uses that term, the law of the spirit of life. Have you ever thought to yourself, what is that law of the spirit of life about? Uh, I mean, if you think about the Mosaic law, it was pretty comprehensive. Things were written down. Things had to be done in a certain way. Think, uh, you know, there, there were practices instruments that were made, vessels that were made, tabernacles, temples that were made. How much more the law of the spirit of life? Have you ever asked yourself, what would it mean to put into practice the law of the spirit of life? Or in fact, what is the law of the spirit of life? Well, the scope of that is too, too broad for what we're speaking about today. We'll get into that sometime. But what I want us to understand is that if we're going to have a vision from God, then that vision needs to have a source. And the source of a godly vision, the source of a godly dream, is the law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life. Because if you have the law of the spirit of life, happy will you be in your dreams. Do you know your dreams and visions can quickly become a nightmare? It's not only God that will give you a dream, my brother. You need to know there's an enemy out there as well. And some dreams can cause a great deal of concern. Some dreams can cause a great deal of anxiety. But if you want a, a dream from God that will be encouraging, exhorting, upbuilding, now, now there will be times that it shake you and rattle you, yes, but the outcome of that will always be for the good, right? If you want those types of dreams, then you need to walk closely with the spirit of life. Because how will you get to know the law of the spirit of life unless you know the spirit of life? And the spirit of life is going to be so faithful in walking with you, in leading, in guiding you, in shepherding you in his spirit as he takes you through the pages of scripture. He's so faithful. He's so blessed. So if you get to know the law of the spirit of life and, and you get to know him in his way, then his vision will start manifesting in your life. Some people have said to me, well, Pastor, I don't have any spiritual dreams. We'll get to that in just a while. But there's two, two answers to that. Firstly, well, yes, you may be having, you're just not recognizing them as such. Secondly, per perhaps you're not walking according to the law of the spirit of life. You, you know, if you want to get to know somebody, getting to know somebody means there's a give and take. You can't get to know God, uh, uh, somebody in your way. You need to take time to get to know who they are. And they need to get to, to, to take time to get to know who you are. And then what happens is there's a gel, there's something that happens. Well, when we get to know God, 
God doesn't need to take time to get to know who we are. But we need to know, get to know and learn how to relate to Him. How to relate to Him in His way. And that's what the law of the Spirit of life is all about. If we're going to come to God, we don't come on our own terms. We come on His terms. And as we take more seriously, as we start developing our prowess and our ability to understand the law of the Spirit of life, you're going to find an amazing thing starts to happen. Your dreams will return to you. Your dreams will return to you. As you connect with that law of the Spirit of life, something happens to the vision within you. Perhaps it's been years since you've dreamed. Perhaps you think you're too exhausted to dream after a long day or after a long week. I want to tell you, when you start walking and tailoring your life according to the law of the spirit of life, it's going to impact your dreams and your visions. Now, this is what I want to say. Don't run after visions. Don't run after visions. If you run after visions, you're going to become flaky. The last thing we need now is any more flaky people in the church. We need some solid people in the church. We need some people of understanding, man. People who can take these spiritual truths and just really relate them in a godly, biblical way. When you start pursuing the law of the spirit of life, God is going to start dropping pictures into your mind. Don't run after the pictures. Pursue the law of the spirit of life and then you will see the pictures start coming your way. Because the law of the Spirit allows you to see what God sees. And the vision of God. And vision in the sense that we are speaking of today. Listen to me carefully. This type of vision, these types of dreams, they don't happen all at once. Vision is a process of progressive revelation to you of the plans that God has got for you. There's a quote. Come on, man. Take out a pen and paper. Write it down. Warren original. Vision is a progressive revelation. It doesn't happen all at once. It's a progressive revelation of the plans that God has got for you. Very often, when God starts revealing His plan for your life, He will do so not just in one picture, but He's going to do it in a series of pictures. Remember I said when you start writing it down, so you may wake up and think, well, God, what was that all about? Well, okay, didn't make sense. Okay, whew, let's forget about that. Then, then you've lost a vital piece of the puzzle. So God starts revealing it in a series. And when you've, like I said earlier, when you start jotting it down, you start seeing a, a bit of the big picture. Remember when God said to Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, 29.11, he said, Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you. You know what God was saying? He's saying, Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you. <laughs> he was saying, he was saying, listen, man, Jeremiah, sometimes you might be confused about your future, your direction, your calling, but I'm not. I know the plans that I have for you, Jeremiah. Listen, Jeremiah, I, I know exactly what I made you for. I know what I tailored you for. I know exactly what it is that's going to bring you the greatest sense of fulfillment, joy, and delight in your life because I made that for you and I made you according to that. I, I, I am the one who passionately, Jeremiah, listen to me, passionately wants to reconcile and get you to walk in the vision that I have for you. Jeremiah, I knew the vision that I had for you even before I laid the foundation of this earth. I knew it, man. Jeremiah, I'm not confused. I, I, I'm not grasping at straws. I, I, I know the vision that I have for you. Now, if we truly trust that God knows, if we truly get a revelation that God knows what He's got planned for us, then that should be a source of great joy for us in our hearts. A source of, okay, let's just, let's just back off a little bit here. Let's just relax. I've been stressing about so much, but God's got this. Okay, so coronavirus, lockdown, world, economy, disease. Okay, hold on one second. God knew all about this before it happened. I, I believe that God can still provide for you 
even though economies are taking such a, a massive uh, hit all around the world. In fact, I believe that there are some doors that God can only open now that the coronavirus has happened. And some people are throwing their arms in the air. Some of God's children have given up hope because of the coronavirus. And you don't see God's hand in this. Listen, man. God's not confused. God knows the plans He has for you. And God only has good plans for His children. I believe that God is going to start giving you a series of pictures. A series of dreams as they pertain to your life. As they start lining you up with the scriptural direction for your life. This is a time of great encouragement because it means that the creator of heaven and earth, God Most High, loves you personally. And he wants to start imparting into you and communicating with you personally about the direction that he has for your life. Don't be hopeless. Never give up hope. God is still on the throne. And I want you now to start getting a fresh passion in your heart. Start getting a fresh invigoration in your heart. Because if anything, I, I trust that what I've shared with you today has taken you and put your feet on a different spiritual level. That spiritual level of expectation. There is another dimension. Some people get hopeless. Some people get despondent because they're trapped on the dimension of the temporal realm. You can understand that with unbelievers. But how sad that is when a son or daughter of God gets trapped on the temporal realm. Well, we're about to go on a spiritual journey together. And what God has laid on my heart in the next few messages coming up, I believe is going to bless you. Because I've served the Lord for quite a while. But now He started showing me some wonderful truths. Now, now that I've been able to shift aside some of the nonsense that I've heard, and th there have been times that I've heard nonsense, and because of that I've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. No. God has really started blessing me, and that's, that, that's why I'm so overjoyed at being able to connect with you, to share with you what God has shown me about these dreams and about these visions. And, and we're going to be picking up this theme again when next we connect. But in the meantime... Here's my prayer for you. May God bless you as you press deeper into the law of the spirit of life. Go pick up his word. Fall in love with his word all over again. May he bless the dreams and the visions that are coming your way. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we love you. Oh Lord, what a joy it is to love you. What a privilege it is to be called your son and your daughter. Oh God, I am overwhelmed at the joy and at the prospect at knowing God that I'm not limited to this temporal realm. But that Lord, you can communicate with us, you talk with us. You take us to different levels. And that's my prayer, Lord God, for Whoever may be listening to this message today, take them to another level. Their, their, their hope is not on this level. Their hope is on another level. Oh God, would you put their feet on another level? I want to pray, Lord God, that you would encourage the hearts of your people. And this is my prayer for each person that is listening. I, I want to speak. I want to release a supernatural anointing right now. That you would touch them in their dreams touch them in their visions Lord God awaken within them a sense of hunger for more of this and say yes I'm so thirsty for this in fact Lord I pray that this message would have been spiritual food for their soul a, a soul that has been hungry for this oh God sustain them keep them encourage them I pray because I speak this in that name which is above every other name the name of my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. God bless you.